What the heck? Togon. Before, we proved that there were infinitely many primes by showing that the product representation of the Riemann zeta function, which is defined over the same domain as the infinite sum version, when you plug in 1, it gives you a product of fractions where all the numerators are prime numbers. And since we know that zeta of 1 diverges because it is equal to the harmonic series, that product must diverge, which means that there must be infinitely many terms, and therefore, since all the numerators are prime numbers, there must therefore be infinitely many primes. So we're going to do a sort of complete reversal of that. We're going to show that a sum of the reciprocals of the primes diverges, which means, again, there must be infinitely many terms, and therefore infinitely many prime numbers. So we saw that the harmonic series, which is just the sum of the reciprocals of integers, grows very, very slowly, but it still diverges. We saw that just the sums over the reciprocal composite numbers also diverges, because a subset of the terms is a scalar multiple of the harmonic series itself, so it must diverge. Proving that the sum of the reciprocal primes diverges is much more difficult, and that's what we're going to do now. What we need to do is again consider the product version of the Riemann zeta function. So we need that zeta of z is equal to the product over the primes of 1 minus p to the minus z to the negative 1. And all we're going to do now is just take the natural logarithm of both sides. So we're going to be considering log of zeta of z, and that's going to be equal to, well, what does a logarithm do to a product? It says that the logarithm of a product is the sum of all the logarithms. So we can rewrite this as a sum over the primes of the natural logarithm of what's inside here. 1 minus p to the minus z. And logarithms take powers of their inputs and bring them out as products. So we'll have minus the logarithm of 1 minus p to the negative z. Now we need one other fact, so we need to move aside for a second. Now the board's not too cluttered, so I'm happy to prove this now. If we consider the geometric series, which is 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus dot dot dot. It's pretty easy to show that this is 1 over 1 minus x for x's with absolute value less than 1. And all we have to do is integrate both sides of this using basic rules for anti-differentiation. And if we integrate this side, we get negative natural logarithm of 1 minus x, which looks a lot like this, right? And now we can integrate this term-wise. This is equal to x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3, etc., right? Which is, of course, equal to the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of x to the k over k. And this still has to hold for x with absolute value less than 1, right? But we know that because this definition is only defined for z with real part greater than 1, the magnitude of z has to be more than 1, right? Which means that 1 over prime numbers, which are also more than 1, to a number that has a magnitude larger than 1, is always going to be less than 1 in absolute value, which means it's totally valid for us to plug a prime number to the power of negative z into here and simply plug it into this equation or plug it into this infinite sum. So we're using this representation of negative log of 1 minus x as an infinite sum to replace this. So we're going to end up with a double sum. So let's do that. So by what I just said, this is going to be equal to the double sum, the first over the prime numbers, of the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of p to the minus zk over k. All I did was plug p to the negative z into the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of x to the k over k. What I'm going to do is, since this starts at 1, I'm going to simply pull out the first term, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the sums since the zeta function is well-defined for z with absolute value greater than 1, which means the natural logarithm is well-defined. This infinite sum converges. It's all well-defined, so it's perfectly fine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip these sums, k equals 1 to infinity of the sum from all over the primes of p to the minus z, k over k. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first term and put it on the outside. So the first term is where k equals 1, which means we're going to have 1 in the denominator and 1 in the power here, which means the first term of this series is just the sum over the primes of p to the negative z. And the rest is just this from k equals 2 onward. So we're going to have the sum from k equals 2 to infinity over the primes of p to the minus zk over k. Right? Not too difficult there. And what is this? This is the sum over the reciprocal prime powers, which is the prime zeta function. Very interesting function. It's essentially the same as the zeta function, right? We can define the prime zeta function as so. The sum over the primes of 1 over p to the z. This is just 1 over 2 to the z plus 1 over 3 to the z 
plus etc over all the prime numbers and it's a very interesting function and we will be looking at it more in the next video so but we have it as two separate terms now and essentially what the gist of the rest of the proof is going to be is we know that since zeta diverges at z equals 1, the natural logarithm of zeta will therefore have to diverge at z equals 1. And so we're just going to take the limit, and we know that it's going to go to infinity. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to prove that this term of this sum with all of these infinite pieces is always bounded and therefore contributes a finite quantity to the eventually infinite sum as we let z go to 1, which means as we let z go to 1, this is just going to look like the sum over all the reciprocal primes. And since this will be bounded by a finite amount, it will mean that the sum over the reciprocals of the primes will have to be the part of this infinite quantity that is the infinite quantity. So that's what we're going to do. First, but first, we need to prove that this is bounded. So z is a complex number, right? z is a complex number, so we can write this as the sum from k equals 2 to infinity over the primes of p to the minus k times x plus i y, where x plus i y is z, all over k. Uh, I hope that's visible. It's right. So it just says x plus i times y. That's I'm just replacing z with its complex number form. I'm going to break this up by the rules of powers, right? I can break the sum of the powers into a product of the bases. So we get the sum from k equals 2 to infinity over the primes of p to the minus k times p to the minus i k y all over k. And now we're simply going to consider the, the magnitude of this quantity, the absolute value if it were all real, and the modulus if it's a complex number, but they all mean the same thing. Now, if I consider the, so I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not saying this is equal to this, I'm simply breaking up the power, I'm writing it as this, and now I'm going to consider the modulus of this whole term. Well, because this is a sum, this by the triangle inequality is less than or equal to the sum over the absolute values. So the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of the sum over the primes of the absolute value of a product is the same as the product of the absolute values. So I can write this as, oops, sorry, I forgot about the kx there. I can write this as the absolute value of p to the minus kx times the absolute value of p to the minus i ky divided by the absolute value of k. Since p is a real number that's always greater than 1, k is a real number that's always greater than 1, and x is a real number that's always greater than 1, right? The x is the real part of z, and this is only defined for a real part of z greater than 1, then that means this is a real number that is positive, which means its absolute value is equal to the number. Likewise, k on its own is only a positive real number at every value that it takes in this infinite sum, so the absolute value of it is also the number. We just have to consider this now. So how can I rewrite this? So I'm going to rewrite the first ones because they are the same as their absolute values. So we get the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of the sum over p of p to the minus kx over k times the absolute value. How do we write this? Well, we can write p as e to the log p, which means we can write this as e to the minus i k y log p. Kind of a mouthful, but it's totally valid. And because of Euler's formula, which I've proved in one of my videos, we can write this as cosine of this power minus sine of this power, because it's negative i. And what we're able to prove is that any number of this form has absolute value 1, or modulus 1, in the complex plane, in that it is always exactly one unit distance away from the origin, which means that this thing has a magnitude of 1, which means it's not changing the size of the number. So we can rewrite this as saying the size of this number, right? The original question was, what is the size of this number? We're comparing it to other things. And we've been able to narrow it down such that this is the sum from k equals 2 to infinity over the primes, essentially 1 over... And what we're going to do is we're going to factor out the 1 over k, because it only depends on k. So 1 over k times the sum over the primes of 1 over p to the minus kx, right? Well... <clears throat> Now we can sort of imagine that the bigger x is, the smaller this fraction is going to be, which means we should make x as small as possible to sort of ensure that we've got the biggest sum possible and, and sort of give ourselves the room for an upper bound. So let's assume that the real part is actually going to 1. So z is going to, z is at least going to a number with a real part of 1. But we've, we've concluded that the size of y doesn't really, the p to the negative i k y doesn't really contribute because it has an absolute value of 1. Um, but so for the sake of bounding this quantity, we're going to assume x is 1 to make this denominator as small as possible, thus making this sum as large as possible. So this is definitely going to be less than, strictly less than, if we let x be 1. And we get the sum 
from k equals 2 to infinity of 1 over k times the sum over the primes of 1 over p to the minus k. k. k was negative up here, but it should have been positive k down there. My mistake, sorry. So 1 over p to the kx is the same as p to the negative kx. So I just made a, a, a power error there. And so this is strictly less than the sum over k equals 2 to infinity of 1 over k over the primes of 1 over p to the k. There's the prime zeta function again. But we're not going to consider it as the prime zeta function. We're going to say, well, this is just the sum over the prime numbers. Surely, if we sum over all the integers, this will be strictly less than that, because it won't. Quick little addition to this video, as I made a mistake, and so I'm just refilming this before we move on to the next step. So what we did in the last part was we were, we were able to prove that this sum from k equals 2 onwards over the primes of p to the negative kz over k, where z is being represented in its complex number form, x plus iy, that that is always less than the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of 1 over k, of times the sum over the primes of 1 over p to the k. Now, because this is only summing over the prime numbers, surely this would be less than if we summed over all the natural numbers. So what do we get? This is less than the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of 1 over k times the sum from n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n to the k. If you recall, earlier on in the video, we were able to show that 1 over n to the k, where n is an input to the function 1 over x to the k, it's always less than the integral over the same interval of this function. So we know that this is going to be strictly less than the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of 1 over k of the sum from n equals 2 to infinity of the integral from n minus 1 to n of 1 over t to the k dt. I hope this is familiar from earlier in the video. Now, because we're summing from n equals 2, we can just plug n in here and get 1 as the lower integral, as the lower inter as the lower bound of the integral and plug in infinity for the top. Because what is this? This is just summing over unit intervals under a function. So we can just sort of add them all up as one integral. So this is equal to the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of 1 over k times the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over t to the k dt. This is just a basic anti-differentiation using powers, so this can easily be evaluated to be 1 over k minus 1. So this is equal to the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of 1 over k times 1 over k minus 1, so I can just multiply that into the denominator. But look at this. This is just the sum over all of the pronic numbers, which was the second fact that I proved, is that this is just equal to 1. Which means what we're able to show is that the sum over k equals 2 to infinity of the sum over the primes of p to the minus zk over k, its magnitude is always less than 1, which means in the complex plane it is some point within the unit circle on the complex plane. So its magnitude is, is, is always strictly less than 1. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove, right? That this part is always bounded, and then as we let z go to 1, we can show that the sum over the reciprocals of the primes is the infinite contributor to the total sum, whereas this is finite. If we now let z go to 1, we get the result that we wanted, right? So let's take the limit as z goes to 1 of the natural logarithm of zeta of z. This has to be equal to the limit as z goes to 1 of the sum over the primes of the reciprocal powers of primes plus the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of the sum over the primes of p to the minus zk over k. We just proved that this becomes a finite quantity. So call the, the limit of this uh, c. It doesn't really matter. It's some finite quantity. And we let z go to 1 here. So we know that this is going to be equal to the sum over the primes of 1 over p, right? Because z is going to 1. So we'd get uh, p to the negative 1, which is 1 over p, plus some bounded amount c. But because we know that as zeta goes to 1, it diverges, which means the natural logarithm of it diverges, then, th then this finite quantity plus the sum over the reciprocal primes has to also diverge. Since this is a finite quantity, it must be the case that the sum over the reciprocals of the primes is also divergent, just like the sum of the composite reciprocals is. So we have just shown that the sum over the primes, over the prime reciprocals, which is 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 5, 
plus forever and ever does in fact diverge. Since this diverges, it must have infinitely many terms, all of which contain a different prime number, which means that there must be, again, infinitely many primes. So that's proof number two, QED. So in the next video, we're going to prove a relationship which is more like this, where we're summing over different powers of all the prime numbers other than the first one because the first ones diverge when you add them all together, right? So we're just going to consider powers from two and above and sort of see what we can make that equal to or show that it is equal to. And so this has been a proof of the infinitude of primes, two different absurd ways. So thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for the next video. I have an Instagram page for the channel. It is at what the hectagon, of course, spelled correctly, unlike my email, right? Hectagon, I spelled in the email with an A here when in fact it's an O. What the hectagon on Instagram. So this is Instagram. I post channel updates there. I also am doing a lot more reading than I used to now, so I'm posting books that I'm reading that I recommend to people. I have a collection of vinyl records that I like to share. Follow me at what the hectagon on Instagram. I'd like to point out that uh, one of my best friends, who is very much into Dungeons and Dragons, has a YouTube channel called Marching West. He does like a little podcast about Dungeons and Dragons. He does Dungeons and Dragons all the time through his Discord server. He's very, very into it, and I'm sure he would appreciate a bit of a mention. So if you're into Dungeons and Dragons, visit his YouTube channel, Marching West. He also has an Instagram account, again, at Marching West. Also, this fellow, Bill and I, are starting a, another YouTube channel. I guess you could call it personal reasons, even though it's just kind of funny. It's called Fredwood Live. On YouTube, we're just called Fredwood. Uh, it's an amalgamation of two different things that uh, were sort of important to us in our college days, um, which are <laughs> getting farther and farther behind us. So this is, again, YouTube. We have a channel called Fredwood. We're going to do kind of silly, just us riffing off of each other vlogs that we edit together in humorous ways. But we're also going to start doing weekly video game streams on Mixer. And on Mixer, our name is Fred Wood Live. So if you want to see two kind of dopey former college students do kind of ridiculous video game streams and also other things that we're going to do on top of that on Mixer, our username is Fred Wood Live, so check us out. Likewise, we have a Twitter account to promote it, also at Fred Wood Live. So I apologize for all of these different promotions. I figured I'd just start putting these out there. So there's a few that I'd like you to check out if you're interested. Is my Instagram account, What the Hectagon. Uh, on YouTube, my buddy Bill's channel, Marching West, it has to do with podcasts and the like relating to Dungeons & Dragons. The Instagram account for channel updates for that channel. Our joint channel, Fredwood, where we're going to be posting stream clips and vlogs that we make, which are not in any way intended to be serious. It's all supposed to be just kind of humorous. We are going to stream on Mixer because that's the only way that we can use the camera that we have on my Xbox One, and we're not about to buy a Kinect to do on Twitch. So Mixer, Fredwood Live, and the Twitter account for that is at Fredwood Live. So if you're interested in any of these things, please give us a follow. I really appreciate it.